When it comes to Pixar's latest lineup, you can tell that the studio is putting in an effort to be more responsible when it comes to representation. One of its more recent releases, Soul, is no exception to that. Blending jazz music and themes about life and death, the movie tells an inspirational story about a man discovering the purpose of life from a vastly different angle than most others do. Namely, from the perspective of being dead. And a cat, but that's- we're getting ahead of ourselves. One thing's for sure, Soul has something for everyone, but what you take away from the movie is up to you. I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and here are 107 facts about Soul. Before we start with the video, we'd just like to take a second to thank our sponsor, Manscaped. Manscaped is the global brand for men's grooming and hygiene products covering everything from head to toe. If you want to start your day off right, you can't do wrong with their all-in-one performance package 4.0, which includes the high-technology lawnmower 4.0 body trimmer, electric, waterproof, and the safest method for beard trimming. As someone with a beard and struggling to keep it maintained, this is an excellent tool choice to keep your face clean. And, you know, it can be used for other areas of your body as well. You can even use it freely without a cord for up to 90 minutes with a full charge. You know, in case you have a, a beard that takes 90 minutes to trim. Go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off plus free international shipping plus two free gifts when you use the promo code FREDERATOR at checkout. Now, on to the facts. Number one. Joe Gardner, played by Jamie Foxx, is Pixar's first black lead character in their, at the time, 23 film lineup. Not many of Pixar's films have human leads, but it still feels like a long overdue gesture. Soul is also the first Pixar movie with a majority black slash African American cast of characters. Number two. According to Pete Docter, who co-wrote and co-directed the film with Ken Powers, the movie was inspired by the emotional turbulence he experienced after writing and directing Inside Out. Going from emotions to soul feels like a pretty natural evolution. Number three. Production of the movie took four years, starting in early 2016 with an initial release date for summer of 2021, which deviated from other movies that Pete Docter worked on that took five years to make. Despite the release date being pushed forward, the team was able to adhere to the tight deadline. Number four. The movie is meant to challenge conventional notions of success and failure and convey that life has meaning that goes beyond personal ambition. Number five. Animators used footage of several music performers, including jazz composer and very recent Grammy sweetheart John Batiste, performing as a reference for the movie's musical sequences. By capturing MIDI data from the sessions, animators were able to retrace the exact key being played on the piano with each note and recreate the performances authentically. Number six. More than serve as a reference, John Batiste also served as the composer for the movie, replacing Pixar standbys like Michael Giacchino. All of the film's jazz arrangements, which gave the movie's New York City its unique sound, were composed and performed by Batiste, who commented that he tried to provide jazz that was both authentic and accessible to all ages. After all, the word jazz casts a really wide net. Number seven. According to Pete Docter, the animators assigned to specific musical instruments often had experience playing them, or at least had a great appreciation for them. I guess so the movie wouldn't fall into the trap of portraying how instruments are played super unrealistically. Number eight. Jamie Foxx, just like his character Joe, is a talented musician in his own right, and a classically trained pianist. He even played Ray Charles in 2004's Ray, winning a Best Actor Oscar for the performance. Number 9. Pete Docter and Ken Powers worked on the development of Joe's character alone for about two years. Number 10. The Hall of Everything has a bunch of references to Pixar movies, including the Pizza Planet truck, of course, as well as the Axiom from WALL-E, the Whale from the Marine Life Institute from Finding Dory, and many more. Research for this video led to multiple findings, and honestly, the amount of references in the hall could probably fill its own 107 facts video. Number 11. Inside Dr. Bjorgensen's Hall of You, there's a statue of Bjorn holding a kid's hand. This is a clear reference to the iconic partner statue that can be found at the entrance of many Disney parks. The statue is one of Walt Disney and Mickey Mouse holding hands. Number 12. Speaking of the man himself, what really happened to Dr. Bjorgensen, who was actually meant to be 22's new mentor? While the movie doesn't tell us this, behind the scenes, the creators envisioned him wandering around the soul world in a lost state with no name tag. A discarded storyboard sequence depicts him being accidentally thrown off the edge and ending up in the soul of a cat on Earth, later becoming a therapy cat because he was a therapist in his previous life. Number 13. The design of the Soul World took a long time and was worked on after the scenes in New York had already been produced. The production crew looked at a lot of references, from ancient Roman and Greek aesthetics to modern college campuses, until finally landing on Old World's fair books which had Swedish sculpture art. This eventually influenced the personality pavilion shapes in the final movie. Number 14. Co-writer and co-director Pete Docter researched many different depictions of the soul and the afterlife in the real world, consulting priests, rabbis, and experts in many religions, including Islam and Hinduism. Number 15. This also carried over into the soul's designs, which were animated in a vaporous, ethereal, and non-physical way, based on definitions about souls by various religions and cultural representatives. 
Number 16. In the first draft of the story, the entire movie took place in the Soul World. 22 was initially the main character, albeit with a different name, but with the same attitude towards Earth. It was about observing life through memories and visualizations of the world in order to talk 22 into going to Earth. But the filmmakers found this wasn't interesting enough, probably because it's so disconnected, and decided to showcase Earth on a more personal level, which is where Joe came in to provide the other side of the coin. Number 17. This is the first Pixar movie to be dedicated to the COVID-19 pandemic in the end credits by making note of the six-foot rule, stating that the movie was created and produced in homes at least six feet away from each other throughout the Bay Area. Number 18. Among its many references, the movie makes fun of a meme from 2015, the famous video of a rat dragging a piece of pizza in New York. You can see exactly this happening in one of the scenes. Number 19. The hardware store that Joe passes by in the movie offers Nine Inch Nails. Nine Inch Nails is the name of Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross's celebrated industrial rock band. Reznor and Ross composed the music for everything involving the afterlife, the ethereal synths and drone sounds serving as a clear divide between the soul world and Earth, which is of course punctuated with bright jazz. Number 20. Hayen Park, who voiced fan favorite gremlin Abby in Turning Red, worked as a storyboard artist on the movie. Number 21. Whenever 22 shapeshifts into someone, she maintains her purple eyes. Number 22. The character 22 in the films is so called because she was the 22nd soul ever created, but her name might also be named after the fact that up to Soul, Pixar had released 22 movies. Soul, as previously stated, is Pixar's 23rd. Number 23. 22's name is also a play on the phrase Catch-22, which is a paradoxical situation from which someone can't escape from because of contradictory rules or limitations, much like both of the leads of the movie, a term coined by Joseph Heller in his novel of the same name. Number 24. While 22 is played by and referred to by the cast with she, her pronouns, for the sake of clarity, 22 doesn't actually have a gender yet. The same goes for the Jerrys, who are voiced by both men and women, and Terry, as they aren't referred to by any gender. Number 25. The movie's themes about life, death, and rebirth had particular resonance for co-director Kemp Powers. In the late 1980s, he accidentally shot and killed his best friend while playing with a gun. It's an incident that haunted him greatly, and he heartbreakingly recounts his story in a spoken word piece of his own creation titled, The Past Wasn't Done With Me. Number 26. Power's involvement had a significant influence on the movie, and not just because he, you know, co-wrote it. In an interview, he revealed that he was instructed by higher-ups at Pixar and Disney to keep the movie out of controversial topics involving black culture, which you know, wouldn't have been super great optics for Disney in 2020. Powers, a black man himself, remained defiant. Instead, he reasoned with the studio with the words, you don't hate the Godfather movies or the Sopranos if you're Italian, so why can't African Americans not have their pop culture anchor in soul? Respect for standing up to the mouse like that and coming out on top. Number 27. Kem Powers originally joined as a co-writer early in development to help write the character Joe and was initially given a 12-week contract, which was then extended. He was subsequently promoted to co-director after his extensive contributions to the movie, making him Pixar's first black director. Powers' previous writing work includes the play and screenplay for One Night in Miami, and he's currently slated to direct the upcoming Across the Spider-Verse films. Number 28. Earlier versions of the film depicted Joe as being much more cynical to his students and openly voicing his opinion on them. When going through rewrites, the team realized that it made Joe kind of unlikable. Powers and Batiste gave input on how Joe should act around his students and what he should say, with much of his dialogue taken almost verbatim from Batiste. Number 29. Initially, Joe Gardner was intended to be a white man interested in animation, which would later change to him being a scientist and afterwards a rock star. While the latter was the first step in fleshing out Joe's character, it wasn't until Powers joined the team that the writers settled on a black jazz musician, which felt more pure and in line with the character's story and the experience of the black community, which is tightly connected to jazz music. Number 30. Following that same line of thought, the barbershop scene in the movie was pitched by Powers due to it being specific to the black experience. Number 31. When Curly introduces Joe to Dorothea Williams, he refers to Joe as the cat I told you about. While cat is classic slang for jazz musicians, it also lightly foreshadows Joe's soul winding up in a cat. Number 32. Dorothea Williams is played by Angela Bassett, who had a cameo appearance in Pixar's 22nd movie, Onward. In that movie, Williams' name pops up on the cover of a vinyl record. Number 33. The story about the fish that Dorothea tells Joe is similar to a commencement speech that David Foster Wallace gave called This Is Water, which explores similar themes of mindfulness and breaking out of a tedious, repetitive life. Number 34. On season 29 of Dancing with the Stars, Nelly and his pro-dance partner, Daniela Karagach, danced to the song It's All Right from Soul for that season's Disney-themed night. This was on September 28, 2020, three months before the movie's release. 
Number 35. When Soul was first announced, David Diggs was in the cast list as Joe's antagonistic neighbor, but later Diggs joined the film as a consultant as the story started changing. All of the scenes between Joe and his neighbor disappeared, and a new scene in the barbershop grew into the missing space. Number 36. Ironically, Diggs' character Paul mocks Joe's musical ambitions as a dead end while Diggs is a successful actor and rapper himself. Diggs is perhaps best known for his work as Thomas Jefferson and the Marquis de Lafayette in Hamilton. Number 37. The studio established an internal culture of trust consisting of black Pixar employees and people from the black community acting as external consultants that oversaw multiple aspects of the movie to ensure its authenticity. Number 38. The subway scene features a reference to the fictional company Brang, which is the startup company of Riley's father from Inside Out. Number 39. Tina Fey, who's the voice of 22, frequently collaborates with Amy Poehler, who voiced Joy in Inside Out, which was also directed by Pete Docter. Number 40. Tina Fey also contributed to the screenplay, helping to write her character's lines, though most of the movie's lines were read directly off the script, with only a few improv takes in between. Number 41. A broccoli pizza from Inside Out appears among the pizzas when Joe tries to show 22 the joys of life. I wonder if he'd consider broccoli pizza a joy of life instead of the assault on human decency that it is, much like pineapple, I will accept no questions on my stance at this time or any time. Number 42. The hospital room that Joe and 22 jump into on their way out of the hospital is room number P742, a reference to P. Sherman 42 Wallaby Way from Finding Nemo. Number 43. The subway station scene also shows that the train has the number 2319 on most of its coaches. 2319 is a code that previously appeared in Pixar's movie Monsters, Inc., which signified child contamination and served as a warning for quarantine. While in today's world, self-quarantine surely isn't a bad thing to do, though we wouldn't recommend that you use that code to warn others on the off chance of someone from your circle having foundational knowledge on a number from a Pixar movie. Number 44. A sports commentator in the movie makes a reference to the New York Knicks by mentioning them losing yet another game. This isn't too far off, considering the Knicks have a really bad track record in real life. Sorry Knicks fans, we're just stating facts. They're not an NBA team, but I'm an Ottawa Senators fan, so you can make fun of me for that. Number 45. In the U Seminar, soul number 108,210,121,415 is introduced. In case you're wondering why they went with that number, it's because it's the same number of people ever born in human history at the time, as estimated by the Population Reference Bureau, it's kind of impossible to get an exact number on this. But it really puts things into a new perspective when you think about 22 being one of the earliest souls in existence and having been stuck in the soul world practically since the beginning of humanity. Number 46. Ryan Coogler, who directed Black Panther, was involved in early development and suggested that the souls speak in different languages in the U Seminar. Number 47. The wall of name tags left behind by 22's former mentors include multiple famous figures in world history, as well as two late Disney and Pixar animators, Joe Grant and Joe Ranft, respectively. Among the historical figures are Muhammad Ali, Albert Einstein, Aretha Franklin, and even Confucius. If Confucius was at his wit's end, then you must be really hard to deal with. Then again, Joe, Movie Joe, not the two animators, had reasonable incentive to help out 22. And yes, the original draft of this script included a far more extensive list of the name tags, but uh, we don't have that much time here. Number 48. While in Joe's body, 22 speaks with one of Joe's students and quotes her former mentor, George Orwell, by comparing public education to the rattling of a stick inside a swill bucket. The real quote is, advertising is like the rattling of a stick inside a swill bucket. Number 49. One historical figure who didn't make it into the movie is Rasputin, the Russian mystic who was notoriously hard to kill for those who opposed him. Surviving getting stabbed, poisoned, shot, and then shot in a separate incident before finally dying and being dumped into the Myalinevka River. The filmmakers wanted to include this fact as a gag in the movie by having Jerry alluding to it when she talks about how the Count hasn't been off in centuries. The joke was deemed too dark and not a lot of people got it, so it was cut. Number 50. This is the first full-length Pixar movie to be released exclusively on Disney Plus without a theatrical debut, a practice Disney would continue for subsequent Pixar releases like Luca and Turning Red, garnering criticism that Disney supposedly doesn't treat Pixar with the same respect as they do for their in-house releases like Encanto and Raya and the Last Dragon, which both sought theatrical releases alongside digital rollouts. Number 51. Soul is Disney's second large-scale animated feature to be preceded by the Disney Plus original logo due to it being released as a Disney Plus original movie. The first being Phineas and Ferb the movie, Candace Against the Universe. Number 52. The Chinese takeout box that appeared on the hedge fund manager's desk is the same one that appeared in previous Pixar films like A Bug's Life, Ratatouille, and Inside Out. Number 53. This is the second Pixar movie to have a post credit scene play after the production logos instead of before. Number 54. This is Pixar's first movie to be released on Christmas. Number 55. This is also the first Pixar movie to have the title card appear at the end of the movie. Number 56. 
The tailoring business owned by Joe's family is based on the real-life advanced European tailoring shop in Berkeley, California. Number 57. Pixar voiceover legend John Ratzenberger has voiced in every single Pixar movie up to Soul, landing him at a proud 22 roles and cameos. But in Soul, unlike his past appearances, he has no credit because you don't hear him, but you see him on screen this time. You can spot his likeness when Joe and 22 are running through the subway. After going through the turnstiles, they run past a man with a white business shirt and red tie that turns and watches them. This has been confirmed to be a likeness created of John Ratzenberger to keep up his continued Pixar appearances. Number 58. The Disney credit in the beginning has a rendition of When You Wish Upon a Star done like it's being played by the inexperienced band class Joe is teaching, a great way to get viewers into the movie immediately. Number 59. According to the Art of Soul book, 22 is a moody, extroverted cynic who is extremely punctual. Number 60. The movies It's a Wonderful Life, A Christmas Carol, Defending Your Life, and A Matter of Life and Death were all influences on the making of the movie. Number 61. Curly wears a t-shirt that reads classic and fusion and free and modal, which are all forms of jazz. Number 62. According to Ken Powers, Mr. Mittens came back to life because the cat had nine lives. A sequence depicting Mr. Mittens returning to his body was storyboarded but discarded before production. Number 63. When Joe is getting his hair cut by Dez, Dez has a picture of his daughter with the bunny doll from Toy Story 4. Number 64. The Jerry's and Terry resemble the Mac OS Finder icon. Their shape design lends itself well to the Cubist art form, which seeks to truthfully represent a person by showing them from different angles simultaneously. Number 65. Animators created two designs for the souls, one for the new souls in the great before, and one for mentor souls, which feature more distinctive characteristics due to having been on Earth already. Animators also created a distinctive design for 22, as the character hadn't been on Earth, but had begun to evolve. Number 66. Ignoring the final shot, the entire movie takes place within a single day. Number 67. Jamie Foxx cried when he recorded the last line of dialogue in the movie, when Joe says, I'm gonna live every minute of it. Number 68. When Joe and 22 are on the subway train, 22 finds a cup under the seat that's still got some stuff inside. Her exclamation of, can you believe it? It's half full, is a fun reference to 22's newfound optimism. Number 69. Mr. Mittens has calico coloring, which can only occur with two X chromosomes in female cats, with very few exceptions. Since Mr. Mittens is not female, this makes him a 1 in 3,000 anomaly. Number 70. Along with Hamilton and Wonder Woman 1984, this was one of the most watched straight-to-home viewing movies released on a streaming service in 2020. Number 71. One of the characters says that they're playing a Sarasvati. This is a strained instrument that's an ancestor of the sitar and is popular in southern India. Number 72. The mystics sail around to the tune of Subterranean Homesick Blues, a song by Bob Dylan, notable for its unique lyrical composition of the time and the music video featuring Dylan rapidly swapping cards with the lyrics on them, featured in the 1967 documentary Don't Look Back. Number 73. The name of the cat therapy service Mr. Mitten works for is called Feline Better, a play on feeling better. Number 74. The storyboard team created approximately 73,811 storyboards during the movie's development. Number 75. In the Hall of Everything, the monuments, which include a Japanese pagoda, Big Ben, the Eiffel Tower, the Golden Gate Bridge, El Castillo and Chichen Itza, and a First Nations totem pole from Canada correspond to the country pavilions in the World Showcase at Epcot. You can also see Cinderella's castle in the background. Number 76. The name of the group Mystics Without Borders is a play on the real-life organization Médecins Sans Frontières, aka Doctors Without Borders. Number 77. The Half Note Jazz Club is modeled after the famous Village Vanguard Jazz Club in New York City. Number 78. Right after Joe and 22 enter Just a Box, there's an outline of the original Disney Railroad passenger cars in the back left. Number 79. When 22 is listing her mentors, one of them is Marie Antoinette. She's seen with only her head because she was beheaded during the French Revolution. 22 is also offering cake because it's often misquoted that Marie Antoinette said let them eat cake when she was told that the people of France were starving. While it's most certainly true that Antoinette's wealth had made her out of touch with the plight of the peasants, the quotation itself, originally Qu'il mange de la brioche, first surfaced in Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Confessions, written in 1765, long before Antoinette supposedly said it herself in 1789. Number 80. In the barbershop, one of the characters is an homage to former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick, who received national attention in 2016 when he began kneeling for the national anthem in protest of police brutality and America's unjust treatment of black people. Since then, Kaepernick has become a major activist and champion for the rights of black people as well as police and prison abolition. Number 81. When you listen closely in the barbershop scene, you can hear a tune referencing jazz hip-hop pioneers, A Tribe Called Quest. Number 82. 
It's estimated that with all the new subscribers that signed up to Disney Plus on the run-up to Christmas of 2020, 13% did so expressly just to see this movie. Number 83. This is Pete Docter's first directorial effort without any involvement from John Lasseter, following his departure as CEO of all of Disney's animation areas, following allegations of improper workplace behaviors and sexual misconduct. Number 84. Towards the beginning of the movie, when Joe is entering the Great Before, there seems to be an interstellar reference as he enters and passes through the fourth dimension. Also, for a split second, Joe appears to be inside a Tesseract. Number 85. One of the storefronts shown early in the movie is called Jimmy Shoes, which is a reference to the famous designer shoe brand, Jimmy Choo. Number 86. When Joe's mom sees him in his late father's suit, she says Ray would have been so proud, a possible reference to Fox's aforementioned role as Ray Charles. Number 87. Despite Joe being the first black protagonist in a Pixar movie, multiple territories chose a Caucasian voice actor for the part. In the Danish dubbed edition, the character is voiced by Nikolai Likas. In response to the criticism of his casting, he said it's completely irrelevant who voices the part, and said, let the man or woman who can perform the work in the best possible way get the job. Those are his words, not mine. Number 88. The movie also earned criticism for having its black character turn into something and not be shown in their regular form for the majority of the movie, a trope that's suspiciously common when it comes to black protagonists. One of the go-to references for the use of this trope is Disney's The Princess and the Frog, where both main characters of color are depicted as frogs for a majority of the movie. Another notable example from around the same time is Spies in Disguise, which sees Blue Sky's first black protagonist, Lance Sterling, played by Will Smith, turn into a bird for most of the film's runtime. Of course, this trope isn't the case for every movie with protagonists protagonists of color, but it does seem to disproportionately affect them. Number 89. Joe's ringtone is the Haitian Fight Song by jazz double bassist Charles Mingus. Number 90. Pete Docter grew up in a very musical family. In fact, two of his sisters are professional musicians. Number 91. The music used when Terry is on screen is reminiscent of the music heard in the Lost Souls hallway from Beetlejuice, but whether or not this is intentional remains to be seen. Number 92. Among the Jerrys is the incredibly distinct voice of British comedian and filmmaker Richard Iowati, known for his work on The Mighty Boosh, Apple and Onion, and The IT Crowd. I'm also biased and just wanted to include this fact because he's a treasure and more people need to know about him. Also, when I looked him up on Wikipedia while researching this, I saw he was listed as a DILF among his main achievements, so, you know, do with that information what you will. Number 93. While on their pursuit of Joe and 22 on Earth, Terry disguises themselves in an ad for a modern art exhibit which depicts a work of art similar in style to Dutch-American painter Pierre Mondrian. Number 94. A fake cover of a real publication of the popular basketball magazine Slam is shown next to the jar of lollipops in the barbershop. Number 95. Before Pixar released any details to the public, a black chauffeur told Kemp Powers that he knew Pixar was making a black movie because he had never driven so many black people to Pixar before. Number 96. Despite Esther Che being credited as the voice of Miho, who's the bassist of Dorothea's quartet, she doesn't have any lines of dialogue. Number 97. According to Powers, the last line of the movie was originally written to be, I'm not sure, but I know I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. This was later changed to, I'm not sure, but I know I'm going to live every minute of it. This is because an animator pointed out to him that life also has painful moments that we still have to live through. Powers found the revised final line more profound. Number 98. The movie had two alternate endings, one of which included Joe accepting his fate and calmly entering the great beyond. This was scrapped because everyone felt that it was robbing him of the chance to live life with a different perspective after everything he learned during the movie's events. Number 99. In another alternate ending, Joe was touring with Dorothea and teaching students privately on the side. 22 was a new student and Joe recognized her. According to Powers, this ending was scrapped because there was something innately not satisfying about it. Number 100. In Japan, the movie was released under the title Soulful World. Number 101. The original title of Soul can be interpreted in at least two different ways. The most obvious interpretation relating to, you know, the concept of a soul. But Soul is, of course, also a shout to soul jazz, which plays a very important role in the movie. Number 102. The teaser trailer depicts a scene that doesn't appear in the movie where 22 does some sort of cowboy dance. Personally, I'm glad it didn't make an appearance on the final product, as even for 22, it feels a bit inauthentic to her character and inconsistent with the movie's tone. Number 103. Joe's character was partially based on middle school band teacher Dr. Peter Archer from Queens, who is also a professional musician and plays the trumpet. 
Number 104. Dorothea's voice actress Angela Bassett found the movie's New York to be particularly authentic. The neighborhood specifically reminded her of Hell's Kitchen, which is a neighborhood in Manhattan. Number 105. Terry is the only soul to not be named Jerry. They're voiced by Rachel House, who also played Grandma Tala in Moana and is a frequent collaborator of director Taika Waititi, appearing in his films Thor Ragnarok, Hunt for the Wilder People, and Jojo Rabbit, among her other credits. Number 106. On April 30th, 2021, Disney Plus released a prequel short titled 22 vs. Earth, which follows 22's attempts to start a rebellion to stop other souls from reaching Earth. And number 107. To end things on a bittersweet note, the writers weren't sure whether or not Joe would make it all the way until the movie's last screening before being finished. According to producer Dana Murray, Joe did go to the great beyond for a long time in the movie's development. Kem Powers added that Joe's fate was the most debated element of the movie, which makes sense considering the movie's main conflict. The choice in itself is kind of a catch-22 as well, as regardless of the ending they had gone with, a portion of viewers would likely have been unsatisfied. Still, Soul managed to be an excellent reflection on life, death, and finding one's purpose. Did you enjoy our list? What fact do you think we missed? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're here, make sure to like and subscribe to see more great videos every week. And remember, Frederator loves you.